A lot of us are still shaken by the three mass shootings earlier this week. Nearly 20 people were shot and killed. While the recovery process begins and politicians continue to make speeches about gun control, we on To The Point have been asking ourselves, what is it going to take to change what has become a reality in our everyday lives? There is no easy answer, but there are lessons to be learned. In tonight's main point, I sat down with Sal Cortez. He is a retired first responder who heard the last gunshots fired from the gunman in the Cleveland Elementary School shooting in Stockton back in 1989. And he has dedicated his life to making sure not just first responders are prepared for an active shooter situation, but that all of us are prepared. I want to first start with Cleveland because you actually responded to the Cleveland Elementary School shooting. What has changed since that school shooting here in California? A tremendous amount has changed since since 1989 and in some regards some things haven't. Um, but I think if you're looking at the big picture of what has changed since 1989 is that we now have a, a, a system that um, deals with active shooter response both at the law enforcement level at the medical level and then also at the civilian level. It's created a system that more broadly defines not only individual responsibilities but collaborative responsibilities between the agencies uh, including the uh, development of uh, incident command systems and unified command systems once you get to the scene. And if we could just touch on the medical law enforcement and civilian side, can you just first start with medical, what's changed on the medical side? Well, I mean, in, in terms of um, how, how first responders on the medical side um, understand uh, what, what can be done to treat victims of mass casualty events is that in 1989, um, the idea of even simple tourniquets was taboo. It was broadly thought that the use of a tourniquet meant that you were going to lose a limb. And so um, the idea of of life over limb didn't didn't strike anyone as something that that would be more important. And then on the law enforcement side, what's really developed there? In the 80s, we had kind of a surround and call out kind of uh, practice. And so instead of actually attempting to, to go and address the threat, it was more of a circle the building and try to negotiate them out. And, and in my second active shooter event, which I responded to, which was at the uh, Lindhurst High School in Olivehurst, that's exactly what happened. The, the, the shooter entered, there, there was a number of fatalities, and then he took hostage a number of students. And as a law enforcement community, we kind of surrounded the place and started negotiating with them. And so um, today, the response with law enforcement is much more aggressive as it should be. We're really in a space now where it's incumbent upon everybody to really take care of themselves, not just law enforcement, but civilians educating themselves on how to respond to these events as well. I mean, is that really the space that we're in as a society? I think if you looked at this whole, um, the landscape of mass casualty events five years ago, you would say, you know, our, our responsibility is in the law enforcement response and mitigating the threat and, you know, dealing with medical care at the time. But um, with the evolution of both the training and response, you see um, an evolution in the response of the shooters. And so they have gotten smarter. And so not that they are necessarily understanding the tactics of law enforcement, but they see the necessity to be smarter in their response. And I think the best and most um, graphic description of that was the Las Vegas shooting from the top of the, the Mandalay Bay. Um, he had what we like to say is a tactical advantage over everyone. And so you now started this evolution of what does it take to uh, prepare civilian response, ensuring that, that civilians take control of their outcome. Really, that's, that's what it's come down to. The most terrifying and the one that is just um, shocking to the senses, to me, is how a six-year-old in Virginia would be inspired to go to the school and be angry enough and to have access to a weapon and go and shoot their teacher. It, it makes, Why does that strike you the most? Because um, you would have to assume, and I'm, I'm going to assume, that this six-year-old has not had the opportunity necessarily to see all that is available both on social media and, and just have life experience. But somehow, this, this child did not like their teacher. And the interesting part of it 
every shooter has given signals that they were going to do what they did. And so even with this six-year-old, there were signals. What is the most concerning thing that you've seen over your years of experience as being the number one concern of these mass shootings increase? the increased intelligence of the shooters. They're getting smarter, but we see a number of shooters now taking tactical high ground in Illinois on 4th of July this past year. We had a young man who actually disguised himself after taking tactical high ground and shooting down into the crowd and then dressed as a female and, and walked away and uh, then was attempting to do another round of shooting when he was caught, you know, about 30 minutes later. How do we protect ourselves? What do we do? Yeah. I think it's more important now than, than ever to understand our environment and to be much more alert and keenly alert of the spaces we go into and the things that we're doing and to not necessarily second guess yourself, but to at least give yourself the opportunity to let your senses tell you what you should be doing. And then in addition to that, having that knowledge, but not knowing what to do with it becomes the greater issue. And so again, accessing training at any level allows you to feel confident in knowing exactly what you can do and should do. These things are not easy to process. Um, and so we certainly don't want people to be fearful of just going outside of their house, but we also don't want them to be, you know, I would say I don't want you to be blind to what is not also out there and just, just have some level of awareness. You know. Like you said, be aware of your environment. Totally, yeah. We have more on the lessons learned since the Cleveland school shooting on abc10.com slash to the point because just last week we dedicated part of our show to this issue, marking 34 years since the Cleveland elementary school shooting. And as for this week's mass shootings, investigations are just now getting underway. Victims are also being honored tonight in the city of Davis. There is a public vigil at eight if you would like to attend. The event will be in the city's Central Park. After the break, five former officers are charged with the second degree murder of Sacramento native Tyree Nichols. What comes next? Tyree Nichols. His name is spread across national news today after five ex police officers in Memphis, Tennessee were charged with second degree murder and other crimes following Tyree's death. Now this is 29 year old Tyree. Today we learned that he was a Sacramento native, a father and a son. And these are the former police officers charged with killing him. After viewing body, cam body camera footage, Nichols family says the officers in Memphis beat Tyree for three minutes following a traffic stop. He died three days later. Roxanne Elias is with us now. Uh, Roxanne, you have been in contact with a community advocate very close to the family. I mean, what is going through their minds right now during this time? Alex, there's a lot of different emotions that's going through their minds. Uh, we spoke to Barry Axius, who is a community advocate here mm -hmm. in the area. Um, we tried to speak to the family earlier today, but understandably, they were just going through so much. Barry says that they feel frustrated, overwhelmed, exhausted, so they weren't necessarily up for talking to us today. Completely understandable, yeah. And did you get to learn about anything as Tyree as a person? I know we've really been trying to look more into that. Um, from what we understand, this person, from everybody that I talked to, no one has had anything bad to say about him. They describe him as a person who loved to smile, never got in trouble, and he loved skateboarding. And what does the family want next in terms of justice? Do they have anything specific that they're wanting? I think the biggest thing right now is they want justice. And um, it's one of the things that, the, one of the reasons that they are trying to uh, not put the video out right away. It's supposed to be released tomorrow, That uh, the video that the police have. The body camera um, video? Yes, mm -hmm. but they're saying, you know what, if it takes holding off, releasing that to the public so that, you know, officials can actually see what happened and serve him justice, then so be it. But as of right now, we do know that the video will be released tomorrow. All right, thank you, Roxanne. Of course, you already know, we will continue to follow this. <laughs> Homelessness crisis is growing in our foothill communities, but there are efforts underway to help in Plaster Nevada counties today. That's after the break. We know California has the nation's largest homeless population, but 
How do we know? Well, every year the federal government requires local communities to count the number of people experiencing homelessness from those living on the streets and in vehicles to people staying in shelters. And all across the nation, that count happened overnight and stretched well into today. Now, we often talk about Sacramento County's unhoused population of some 9,300 people, according to last year's count. But in our foothill communities, they are facing this challenge, too. Rebecca Habegger went to Roseville to talk to people who are directly impacted. What comes to mind when you think of homelessness? Probably thinking, what did they do to get themselves here? It's probably a, like, a, a pushing fault onto whoever's experiencing homelessness. 32-year-old Marissa Wittrian knows the problem with that stereotype firsthand. For me, it's not drugs, it's not alcohol. I didn't choose this. Where do I fit into that thinking? Severely injured during the birth of her daughter in the Bay Area nearly six years ago, Wittrian fought to get on disability after a painful surgery and ongoing complications stemming from the delivery. Using retroactive disability benefits, she bought a fifth wheel trailer and, along with her mother and young daughter, bounced around temporary housing situations until her mom moved to Plastic. County. I ended up having to switch gears and put my trailer into storage and my mom not having any room for us this is where we ended up so it's kind of spiraled from there it's just been barrier after barrier for the last few months Wittrian and her daughter have been staying at the gathering Inn, which provides shelter and services to people experiencing homelessness in Placer County they lost their job because of COVID or because their kid was sick and they had to take too much time off and and they're living in their car and it's too cold out. Roland Tellier is the CEO of The Gathering Inn. We help them get any uh, legal documents ready, um, work on them with life skills, help them with uh, budgeting, financial management, get a bank account, help them find employment, um, and do everything we can to get them ready to move into their own housing. But she points out housing is scarce and expensive. Even with disability, I wasn't making two and a half times the rent, even for the low income, what's considered affordable. When your income only allows for $500 in rent, it's very difficult to find those, those places to house them. And the numbers reflect that. Last year, 750 people were counted as experiencing homelessness in Placer County and in Nevada County, 527 people. Yes, there is a problem with drugs and alcohol. I'm not gonna, you know, sugarcoat that. But I, I think by and large, it's it's the, the population at large is not is not to be afraid of. They just need help. Just this week, Placer County supervisors approved a million dollars for what they are calling a mobile temporary low barrier shelter. It will be in Auburn starting in mid-February and it will offer some 50 tents with cots, bathrooms and a lot of other services. Now, the funding runs through the end of June. The shelter is the result of a lawsuit settlement agreement. Sacramento-based civil rights attorney Mark Marin filed a class property claim on behalf of several unhoused people. And as the homelessness crisis grows, Caltrans is requesting more than $20 million from the state to help the agency continue to remove what they call hazardous material from encampments. And we've recently covered Caltrans removals process around the WX freeway in downtown Sacramento. Caltrans tells us this tells the state that they have seen a 205% increase in calls for service just from 2016 to 2021. Every day, PG&E makes decisions that can make the difference between life and death to the 16 million people who live inside of its domain. And those decisions are under the microscope in a Shasta County courtroom right now, where PG&E is under criminal manslaughter hearing. Testimony on the Zog fire went into its fifth day today, and you'll only see this story on ABC 10 because we were the only news organization who showed up. Here's our investigative reporter, Brandon Riddiman. The Zog fire started in 2020 when a big pine tree fell onto a PG&E power line and sparked the first flames. Prosecutors say PG&E was criminally negligent, that it had a duty to remove that tree, but failed to do so. And that's why they've charged the company with manslaughter for the deaths of these four people. 
This is the tree at the heart of the case. The DA says that PG&E marked this tree as a known hazard in 2018. That was after the car fire burned in the Redding area. But then over the course of the next two years, nobody from PG&E found it again or decided to cut it down. And one reason they say is because the subsequent inspections that PG&E left this problem to didn't actually walk all the way around the trunk of the tree to see whether there was a problem. And in this case, the tree had a big wound on the back side of it, the side you couldn't see from power lines. We heard from Ken Loomis. He's a PG&E manager. He took the stand today, and he actually spoke up about this very issue in 2019. He filed paperwork with the company warning that inspectors weren't walking 360 degrees all the way around trees. In that warning, he said, quote, tree defects not in plain view from the right of way, that's where the power line is, will go unnoticed and tree not worked inconsistency between policy documents and actual practice re results in legal liability. Again, that was in April of 2018. Sure enough, just a year later, the Zog fire started and now PG&E is facing these 31 criminal charges in that fire. The prosecution expects to wrap up its case next week. After that, PG&E is going to put on a defense. All of this is a preliminary hearing for the judge to decide whether this case will be bound over for trial. In Shasta County, I'm Brandon Ridiman. The Firepower Money team will continue to cover these hearings and brings you the latest of what happens in the courtroom. You can also text FPM to 916-321-3310. We'll send you developments in PG&E's fire crisis and how the government is handling all of it. All right, here are some of the other stories that people are talking about today. Vacaville has been named the most affordable place to retire in California. Listen up to this, a personal finance site, Go Banking Rates. They crunched all the numbers and accounted for the cost of a one-bedroom rental, groceries, and health care. So Vacaville's cost to rent averaged just under $1,500, while groceries and health care averages around $450 each. Other cities on the list include Citrus Heights and Fairfield. Democratic Congressman Adam Schiff is entering the 2024 California U.S. Senate race. He rose to national prominence as the lead prosecutor in President Donald Trump's first impeachment trial. The seat is now head by, held by Senator Dianne Feinstein, who is 89 years old and is the oldest member of Congress. She has not said if she will seek re-election. And things are looking up for the state's drought conditions. The series of storms that we just saw, uh, they brought us enough water supply to public water agencies with five times more than they were scheduled to get. So, some pretty good news there, right, Carly? <laughs> Definitely some good news as we talk about our drought conditions. The drought monitor that was released today and we have seen huge improvements. Remember when most of the state looked like this in the red and that maroon shade? This is no more. We know that as of the last few weeks, but I want to show you this in comparison. December 28th, this is right around the times December 26th, when we first got the first storm, then the next after the next after the next. And it was just a tumble effect there. We saw exceptional drought 7% extreme at 35% of the state there. But take a look as time has moved on as we've moved past an entire month now we are now looking at much better conditions most areas of the central valley now seeing moderate drought that severe drought color in orange here has been taken away from this chunk as of last week and that is showing us better numbers take a look at the comparison just from last week you can see this orange shade here from january 17th that put us here in that 43% of severe drought. Now we are at 33% improving by 10% as that massive chunk has been diminished and we are seeing better conditions. And as we continue on, we are seeing water allocation now at 30% as opposed to that 5% number that was given out early December. So huge difference maker there. I want to talk about snow because this is one of the big impacts for us. The more snow we have, the better our snowpack is, the more can fill our reservoirs later on. The water year snow to date, 356.5 inches. Look at the average water year. In an entire water year, that is October 1st through September 30th, we get about 360. We are just four inches away from actually meeting our average water year. So, wow, we're doing it at record speed and time. We are looking in mostly clear skies before the next system arrives into Sunday, which could actually bring us that extra four inches we are looking for as that moves from Sunday into Monday. And I want to show you quickly your 10 day forecast as we are going to look at some of those temperatures right around those mid to low 50s for the weekend and upper 40s on Sunday. Thank you so much for joining us tonight.
I know it has been a very heavy week, so if you do need someone to talk to, Cal Hope is always offering help from counselors. You can visit them at calhope.org or you can call 1-833-317-HOPE to connect with a counselor. I've been saying it all week, but I'll say it again. Please take care of yourself and let's take care of each other. I'll see you tomorrow. Hey, it's Alex. Just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I really love hearing from everyone and I hope that you'll stay in touch. Reach out to me on Facebook at Alex Bell TV, or you can email me at to the point at abc10.com or you can even send me a text message at 916-321-3310.